inches. Can you believe it? 9 by 12 feet is more typical. But here's the scene I'm going to paint. Let me zoom in here for you. Something like this. I'm about 10 miles from my home. And uh, yeah, that's a pretty nice frame right there. Wow. <laughs> I'm glad I did that. Okay, I'm about 10 miles from my home. And I just, just driving around for the third, the fourth day in a row. For the fourth day in a row, just driving. Just to see what I can see. And I'm going to do something very unusual for me. I am going to paint straight up in oils. No, no layers of acrylic. Just plain old fashioned. So you could very much say... I'm going to try to do a real plein air painting. Whoops. It, now, if I, I would really wish, really, really wish that I had some, um, um, good old fashioned turpentine on me, but alas, I do not. So I am turpentineless. Because this would be the perfect, the perfect time to whip out some turpentine. Perfect time for turpentine. I don't think Gamsol works quite the same. Although, to tell you the truth, uh, that's what I've got on my brushes right now. A tiny bit of liquid and, and um, my brush is damp with Gamsol. Okay, and as you can see, I'm just quickly toning my canvas with various shades. <laughs> roughly, very roughly akin to, you know, where I think the, the colors are going to be in my painting. There's a red barn. That's a red barn. This is a red barn. And so on. This is a real... A real outside of the box adventure for me. <sighs> okay. There. We have a toned canvas. Now I think I'm going to do some drawing. Just as in the other uh, three paintings that I've done so far this week. Yes, I'm standing at a beautiful farm. Now let me Let me see beyond I mean, this, is, this is pretty nice isn't it i mean if you're a farmer i think i think you call this nice uh beautiful country and there we go there's wide angle lens that's what it looks like more like what it looks like in real life very very carefully kept farm i don't have any illusions that um you know the owners don't show up here every day this looks like the kind of place where not the owners, but whoever's working this property is here every day. So I've got my van parked behind me. Uh, I'm about 150 yards off the road. You can hear school bus going by right now. And uh, I've got my doors open on my van. I'm just trying to look like, you know, I'm not trying to hide anything. I'm just trying to look like, I mean no harm, I'm good, everything's okay. Don't shoot, don't shoot. <laughs> I'm trying to say don't shoot. <laughs> Let's try to get some things. The basic composition. Let's try to get the basic composition composed, shall we? Now, this is the way I approach oil paintings uh, when, when I'm not doing my acrylic underpainting. And as you can see I think probably see there's a pretty high degree of correlation between my even though I'm not doing acrylics you can still kind of tell it's me painting I would I would think because of the nature of the marks that I, I when I teach which I do often I teach a you know introduction to oil painting and when I teach that, I don't, I don't typically teach my technique, you know, the layers of and so on. If it's, a, if it's an oil painting class, I teach, but I do 
do this approach, which is start with very thin layers of transparent color and get your drawing down and so on, get some underpainting down and then come back and do thick stuff on top of it. One of my favorite artists these days is a guy named Tibor Negi, N-A-G-Y, Tibor Negi. Not to be confused with the Tibor Negi Gallery in New York City. Funny thing, must be a common name somewhere because there's two of them. Anyway, he's an artist and, and uh, he doesn't have a lot of step-by-step -step stuff on his website, but from what I can see, he starts out very much in this manner. Throwing down very thin layers, and he uses turpentine, and again, I wish I had turpentine out here today. Some of you, of course, I mean, in the olden days, everybody used turpentine. My dad was an oil painter, and I remember the smell of turpentine wafting up from the basement or wherever he was painting. Um, nowadays, almost nobody uses it, but the, 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 the real purpose for using it is, or the best time to use it is a place like this. Outdoors, <laughs> that's in my opinion, really important. Don't even think about taking it indoors. Just leave it outside. And the purpose of turpentine is it evaporates very, very, very quickly and leaves just the paint on your canvas. And uh, so it's a very fast, fast working medium. And that's why people still use it to this day. I'm having a hard time getting the canvas to receive enough dark, dark stuff to get my drawing down. It's a little bit irritating, but I uh, obligate myself, not in the least, to make this a successful painting. <laughs> in other words, if this painting doesn't turn out I can just say, see, I told you. <laughs> Nobody should paint in that technique. composition here. I've moved a few things around here and there. So by the way, I plan to have this painting done in less in under two hours, which is a good thing because the, the daylight over over me, behind me, is not gonna last probably even two hours. So I uh I don't have much choice but to finish it or go home. And I'd rather finish it here than go home. There are actually a number of tall pine trees behind this barn, but I don't think I like them. I think I like the the empty sky back there better. Some small, there's some scrubby scrub growth back there. Thinking, thinking, thinking. Let me go ahead and try to get my darkest darks darkened in. <laughs> uh, 
How's that for a sentence for you? Let me get my darkest darks darkened in. Just right in here. And by the way, here I am painting uh, a real, real difficult thing with the sun. Now it's low sun, it's a warm evening sun, but the sun directly on my canvas. That's, that's the kind of thing you just tell people, just don't do that. <laughs> just don't, no, don't do that. <laughs> I tell my students that all the time. No, don't do that. What are you thinking? You cannot paint with... But here I am, doing it. Just doing it. Trying to now this is pretty close to blocking in, isn't it? You know that thing that I usually rail against to say don't block in a painting? Blob it in. Well I think when you're painting this quickly, maybe <laughs> maybe that's an issue. Maybe you have to bl block it in when you're painting. It have to be done in a very short amount of time. So here I am blocking in a painting. Now once again I really want to make much of this tree. Another oak tree with half the leaves on it, half the leaves off. I think I hear a farm implement coming, but I don't see it. So We will continue, won't we? We will continue. Okay, that's pretty much, that's what I would call blocking in a painting right there. Again, what, th what thing I usually rail against. I say, don't, I say don't block in a painting, blob in a painting. Maybe I should change that and say, unless you're doing a quick draw, you know, unless your painting's got to be done in an hour and a half and you don't have time to change your mind. But I'm going to call that underpainting finished. I'm going to do a couple things to that before I continue with the, the final layer of paint. I'm going to scratch and I'm going to wipe off. Normally I'd wipe off with a rag this painting is so small I might have to wipe off with a brush so we'll see but the principle is and again when I teach when I this is by the way for those of you who want to learn how to paint but you don't want to paint the way I do this is a bit this is a broadcast for you the way I'm painting right now is quite traditional now, I didn't do a I did not do a charcoal sketch true so I didn't that's one traditional thing that I am not doing right now um, but but pretty traditional in approach right at the moment. Pardon me while I clean out these brushes. Okay, I think I'm going to rag first and scratch second. So I just happen to have a little bit of a old t-shirt right here. And I'm now looking for stuff that is light. So if you follow me normally, uh, you you understand, don't you, that at this point, if everything's acrylic, I would come back with white acrylic, right? Well, this lifting out with a rag sort of takes the place of the white acrylics. Does it make sense? And this might be a little bit unconventional and. I'm trying to choose my words carefully, but not, not, not too, not too unconventional. I'm tr you know, I'm trying to go back even to, you know, 50 years ago, watching my dad paint. Did he, yeah, probably, probably. Did he lift out with a rag? You know, and 50 years ago, I, I do know just from look, stuff I've looked at, stuff I've watched and so on, and watching, remembering my dad painting, um, there were a number of things that everybody did uh, 
because that was just the way you painted. Um, almost everybody did a, a charcoal sketch underneath their their oil painting. Um, almost everybody used nothing but linseed oil as a medium, and it was just you just added a tiny bit of linseed oil to your paint to make it flow a little bit better. It wasn't like you used tons of it to make to make transparent. Uh, and everybody painted opaque, essentially opaque oil paint. And in the day, you when you do paint uh, traditional opaque oil painting, you start with the sky. You paint the blue sky, then you paint the mountains and the hills, and then the trees, then the barn in front of the trees, then the tree in front of the barn, then the weeds in front of the tree, and so on. You paint from back forward because everything is opaque. So that just makes sense. Uh, to paint back forward from the back and when if it's a landscape then you paint the sky if it's a still life you paint the you know the background behind the object that's I'm just and and then every once in a while to even to today I run into people who either they used to paint this this way or they knew people who painted this way and um, students who who still sort of think that that's the way people paint and of course you can paint that way I'm sure there are many probably some fabulous artists who still paint in that manner but uh, even most people don't paint that way now uh, I, I think it's safe to say because I certainly don't like the linseed oil I'm scratching trying to get the impression of a tin roof down there so what I'm doing right now I think I would con consider it not terribly conventional slightly unconventional just I'm just trying to give you a especially you students. Is this typical? The answer is, mm, not quite. Now all of this, of course, all of this that I'm doing now is underpainting, right? Um, You can get an awful lot of work done, a lot of the work done just by lifting with a rag and scratching, can't you? Oh, I know what I was going to say. A lot. Some. What. What. The. The one thing from the olden days that more students um, ill-advisedly bring forward <laughs> from the olden days is their understanding of paint mediums. As I said, back in the old days, uh, everybody used linseed oil, and, I, and of course, I don't mean everybody, but you know what I mean. Most people. Um, of course, there were always cutting people, cutting-edge people doing unconventional things. Um, you know, William Bouguereau, I, I took a class from one of the Bouguereau experts, Frank, Gavone, Frank Gavino, many, many years ago. And he, you know, fr William Bouguereau didn't use just straight up linseed oil. He had this very sophisticated special soup that he made up with varnish, linseed oil, stand oil, and turpentine. 
ratios of, of each. But the one thing that people have brought forward most is this notion that you just use, when you use a medium, you just use tiny little bits. That's, and, and when people take my class for the first time, and I tell them, you know, in the, in the acrylic phase, I use, depending on what kind of acrylic you're using, if you're using good, high quality, heavy, uh, heavy body acrylic, then you um, use one part, roughly one part paint and ten parts, uh, ten parts medium. And many people are like, what? It's a completely foreign concept to them, uh, understandably, because they think of medium as being, you just add a little bit of medium to your paint. And the way I've been in my world is quite the opposite, quite the opposite. I add just a little bit of paint to my medium, both in the acrylic and the oil phase. Okay, let's do some of this, get some of this sky light back in here. There are leaves on this tree. I'll go ahead and orange, brown, russet. <laughs> Why are leaves russet? I think it's because leaves rustle. <laughs> they rustle in the breeze. So the color they are is russet. I don't really think that's why they say that, but. I'm almost done with the scratching and the and the erasing. I'm going to do again comparable to what I've been doing lately with my acrylics in the oil stage. Um, I do a push the color phase. I'm going to do that right here. I want this this barn beside me to be red. That certainly aids in the illusion that it is in fact a barn, which it is. And I want to do the same thing with the building back here. I want it to be more red. So now I'm just Pushing color, again, still in the underpainting phase. But the more work you can have finished in the under, underpainting phase, then the less work you have to do in the overpainting phase. And your job, painting job, will be a lot easier. Whatever you can do in the loose underpainting phase. This is all loose, is it not? I'm going to have to wipe some paint off of that and then come back and make that red. Okay, are you buying it? Is it looking like a... Just a second, I'll, I'll point you at my subject matter once again so you can see what it is I'm trying to draw. Let me, let me point you over there. There it is. Now you recognize it. Uh, just a little bit more, a few more holes out of the sky. Out of the tree, I should say. Sky holes. Ah, I know, one another bit of color that I want to do. Let's get those russet leaves. <laughs> Let's get those rustling russet leaves in the color of orange. <laughs> Unless you're a decorator, then it's the color is a russet. <laughs> uh, 
I am dry. Yes, I am driving myself paint crazy painting with one hand. Okay, there's some... <laughs> I'm not going to say that word again. It begins with the letter R. That sounds like the word Rus Russell. <laughs> there's some orange-ish leaves. Uh, do I... I need to do some... I need to do a little bit of green down here. Yeah, there's this delightful little streak of green. Bright green. Spring green. Now this is this is kind of uh, <laughs> that did that was a complete fail. Let me clean this brush. <laughs> that was not the color I wanted at all. Let's try that again. Still not spring green, but it'll do. I'm not gonna not gonna do that again. Okay. Can I officially pronounce the Nope, I can't, because I'm looking for little hints of color any, every, anywhere else, and there is some. There's little bits of green, dark green down here in the shadow. Now, right before, oh, you know what am I going to do? Yeah, 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 let's do some pencil. Noth nothing to say we can't do, nothing that says we can't do some some uh, pencil in a small plain air. Have you ever heard of the term quick draw? It's, a, it's an event that many uh, plain air competitions will have t a typical plain air event, you know, lasts a couple days. But then on the last day of the event, I've never done a quick draw. Oh, no, 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 that's not true. I have. I forgot. Um, but on the last day, they'll have... Uh, a quick draw competition where you've got two hours to finish a painting. Maybe I'm practicing for my next quick draw event, eh? It's very possible that that's what I'm doing. I don't even have one on the calendar, so I don't know, you know. But yes, let's, let's, I'm saying to myself, let's do, let's stick with the, uh, let's stick with the uh, black pencil stuff. Again, do you remember my little trick? Boy, I was so happy the day I learned this. The, the, the ribs in this tin roof are, in actuality, of course, perfectly even, correct? correct. But in the underpainting stage, I don't necessarily want to paint them perfectly even. I want them to be irregular. Not only is it okay for them to be irregular, it's actually to my advantage if they are slightly off. Because if I accidentally put all of those lines in exactly the right place, then when, I, when it came time to do the overpainting, the finished layer, I would, of course, have to put them in the, in the correct place again. And uh, both the underpainting and the overpainting lining up perfectly creates a very boring painting. So it's actually to my advantage if these lines are all a little bit off. Same thing, these lines, anything like that. Okay, uh, for some reason, well, no, but look what's look what's going on overhead here. This is the second interesting phenomenon I have seen in the sky today. The first one, believe it or not, was I was at home for a quick lunch, and my kids, my grandchildren, and I were outside, and we looked up in the air, and there were I counted them roughly sixty six zero sixty buzzers flying in circles way overhead a couple several hundred feet up in the air 60 of them crazy and we all kept saying we're not dead we're not dead <laughs> wiggle kids wiggle <laughs> we finally persuaded them we weren't dead and they flew off <laughs> Just 
Anyway, as I was saying, I entertained myself. I was so happy that there's nobody within 500 yards of me, as far as I could tell. So I can laugh at my own jokes. And you guys can't punch me, so all is well. <laughs> there will be strictly no punching allowed on this YouTube channel. No punching allowed. <laughs> I and I uh, YouTube bumped bumped me off a while ago. So I, when that happens, I'm never sure um, how much you catch and how much you miss. But I've got to tell you, if just in case you missed it, so my friend Toby, who I think is in Germany, who is a young man who follows me often. I don't know if he's on today or not. Sorry, I'll find out in a bit. But he, he came up with the term. I think, at least I think he came up with the term. Maybe he got it from somebody else. Sky holes per poorly done are sky dots. <laughs> and yes, this is the second time I'm laughing about this in just a few minutes. So I think it's funny. <laughs> sky dots. Whatever you do, don't do sky dots. <laughs> <laughs> we have fights going on on my YouTube channel. <laughs> it's a good thing I said there will be no punching allowed on my YouTube channel. <laughs> Strictly forbidden. No punching, boys. <laughs> oh, man. Rough crowd. <laughs> I'll see what that's about later. Okay, I'm going to call that finished, and my mid-background I don't think needs really anything at all. Um, let me wipe off these brushes while I'm thinking. I think I'm going to do the roofs, the roofses, or as they say in Michigan, the roofs of the barns. Barn roofs. My parents grew up in, are both Canadian, grew up in Canada, and, um, but we, me and my siblings, grew up most of our lives in Michigan. But because my parents weren't from Michigan, they were had the freedom to be language snobs. <laughs> I say this with deepest affection. I'm quite glad that I was raised by language snobs. What is a language snob? So glad you asked. A language snob is somebody who speaks the king's English probably better than the king. <laughs> and I'm sure there's the phenomenon is, exists in every language whether that language has a king or not. There's some people that their brain works linguistically and and they, they know proper grammar and proper usage and they enjoy proper grammar and proper usage and, and so they tend to lord it over, <laughs> if I may, the poor people who just aren't born with that language gene. And... Uh, kind of the house I grew up in, but, uh, and I inherited some of that, those same tendencies, <laughs> uh, and I'm not, again, I'm not complaining, I, I'm very glad that, for me, at growing up as a kid, you know, grammar usage was easy, like all those tests in junior high and high school, all those English tests, you know, which one is proper, um, I knew instantly whichever what was proper because it's what sounded right to me because it was the the language that was spoken in my home. So, unlike some people, I remember a friend of mine years and years ago who grew up way out in the country of eastern North Carolina and he went to university and he decided to better himself, if you will. Good for him. And uh, he, he told me that when he was taking those tests, he, he had just the exact opposite response. Whatever sounded right to him, he knew it was wrong. And, and this, this technique actually worked for him. <laughs> that that um, what he was used to hearing, he, he came to learn 
that what he was used to hearing in his home was almost always uh, incorrect. <laughs> so that's the way he learned. That's the way he learned to speak the King's English was, if it sounds right to me, it's wrong. So I grew up in a home where if it sounds right to me, it's right, because that's the English I grew up with. And so it's, it's always fun. There are regionalisms. You know, every part of the country has its own funny little habits. I'll pick on Minnesota for a while. My wife and I lived in Minnesota many years ago. And it's the only... And of course, it may bleed over into to Iowa and Wisconsin. I'm not sure, but it's it's a primarily a Minnesotan thing. They they uh, dangle the prep the preposition with. Uh, the rest of the country says, "Hey, do you want to go with me?" And Minnesotans do not say, "Hey, do you want to go with me?" Or do you want to go with Grandma? Or do you want to go with Dad? Or do you want to go with Santa? Um, in Minnesota, they just say, "You want to come with? You want to go with?" Interesting, huh? interesting and it's the language is beautiful and it's very democratic people can say whatever they want of course unless you want to be thought intelligent then you can't say whatever you want if you want to be regarded intelligent then you have to use proper not just I, the words not proper grammar it's proper usage I know um, so that's why I'm calling this a roof <laughs> Even though in Michigan, many parts of Michigan, it's a roof. Okay. And is it a route or a route? Is it data or data? Uh huh. Depending on what part of the country you came from, it changes your answer to all those questions. I'm just a doggone wealth of information, aren't I? <laughs> Thanks for tuning in. <laughs> for Uncle Dan's <laughs> Grammar Corner. <laughs> uh, am I still recording? Yeah. <laughs> for better or worse, I am. How many thumbs down do I have? <laughs> no, thank goodness. No thumbs down at the moment. Isn't that a nice roof, though? Roof? <laughs> Isn't that a nice roof? Again, a repeated motif. In this case, the ribs. The ribs in a tin roof. A repeated motif. You need to render the repetition with different technique. So I have at least three or four different Techniques. I have pencil, um, painting, negative painting, positive painting, and scratching. Four different methods for rendering what is essentially the same thing over and over and over. In other words, you don't want to uh, use the same technique to render this repeating pattern because it's boring. It's irritating to the viewer to see that you did the same thing, you know, 17 different times across the roof of this barn. Yes, it is. Don't you even try to argue with me. <laughs> now he's taking offense, they say. Now he's getting sensitive. <laughs> Got his dander up. <laughs> okay, dander back down. Dander back down. These are hard, hard bought, hard paid for lessons. <laughs> I don't want you to dismiss them too quickly. I paid a lot for. I made. A, I made these mistakes. Everything I tell you about is almost always because I made that mistake. Sometimes for a long time. Here's another. Um, by the way, I'm very much enjoying doing this cool gray. Uh, translucent paint on top of 